थ्री टू वन स्टार्ट yeah so uh, good morning uh, everybody from uh, uk and hello to all our uh, worldwide uh, viewers uh, watching this live webinars uh, organized by northwest education academy uh, in collaboration uh, with otho tv uk uh, thank you for joining us on sunday uh, as you must have seen uh, that over last 6 months uh, we've organized multiple webinars on this platform form and uh, we've had a viewership of around uh, 2000 on an average each webinar and I, i must say thank you to all our previous speakers and the viewers as well uh, who have been uh, listening to us and giving us positive feedback uh, in today's webinar as you can see uh, the program which we've shared uh, we've got uh, the distinguished speakers uh, from uh, writington hospital uh they have more than 6 decades of combined experience in shoulder surgery and uh, they will provide their views on a uh, road to success to shoulder arthroplasty uh we would have a question and answer session after individual talk uh, and also at the end of the webinar uh viewers can uh, use the slide or button at the bottom of their screen to pose their questions to the speaker and we'll pick up those uh, at the end of the talk as you can uh, see the shoulder arthroplasty has evolved over last 6 decades since uh, introduction of the knee prosthesis in 1950 there have been a lot of changes have done and it's continuing to improve uh, the patient's outcome as well as survival of prosthesis to give us uh, more information on that we are, we've got a uh, professor trail here uh, as our uh, first speaker uh, Professor Trail uh, doesn't need introduction uh, as such as he's been known worldwide for his contribution to upper limb surgeries. Uh, in fact, if I have to give his introduction, I think the time given for our webinar would be much shorter. So it would be just injustice to give his introduction within a minute or two. But I'll try my best. Uh, Professor Trail has been a orthopedic uh, and upper limb consultant for more than thirty years now. Uh, he is a senior clinician at Wrightington Hospital and head of services. Having completed his uh, training from the Northwest, he's got an extensive fellowship experience from uh, United States, Europe, uh, and also his clinical practice over the last thirty years. Uh, in fact, uh, if I'm not wrong, he spent his uh, first two two decades at the uh, royal manchester uh, uh, children hospital and then uh, contributed significantly to the development of uh, upper limb unit at writington hospital uh, he has been former president to the british uh, society for surgery of the hand and uh, very much associated with other uh, upper limb societies in the country as well uh, he's got extensive research Uh, experience with more than 120 research papers he has authored several books uh, on uh, upper limb surgeries and he's been a guest lecturer for many many coveted lectures across different continents over last uh, few decades in addition to uh, his research work and clinical work he has spent a significant amount of time in uh, developing a new joint replacement used in shoulder elbow and hand surgery and he's helped number of uh, new generation of shoulder surgeons with the fellowship experience he provides at writington hospital so over to you prof uh, regarding your first talk Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, introduction. I hope you can all see my talk and uh, hear my voice. <clears throat> um, my remit today is to talk about evolution and indications of shoulder arthroplasty. I'm going to concentrate specifically on uh, anatomic shoulder replacements. Um, that's what Ravi's asked me to do. I, as as you've heard, I, I've been around quite a long time and I started doing implants in the late 1980s so whilst I wasn't at the very beginning of shoulder arthroplasty I have uh, spent a lot of time uh, watching it evolve as uh, you may or may not know certainly these are figures from uh, North America uh, uh, 
They're mirrored by pretty much every other country in the world, whilst hip and knee arthroplasty numbers have probably stabilised, certainly in the UK. The numbers of shoulders are growing quite uh, dramatically, uh, and it's a big growth area. If you went back to 1989 or 1988, you'd see the indications for uh, anatomic shoulder replacement, basically osteoarthritis, with an intact functioning cuff, uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, with, with the same indications, uh, AVN revisions and fracture. Pretty much the only implant available at that time was an anatomic. So that's where we started. Uh, the first uh, successful shoulder arthroplasty or anatomic shoulder arthroplasty is credited to, to Nia, Charles Nia, who did his first hemiarthroplasty in 1955 and his first total arthroplasty in 1974. And here's, you can see that's actually uh, the implant itself. There are only three components. and uh, That's actually my first shoulder replacement actually I ever did in a patient. Uh, his results were reviewed in 1984 for, at the Mayo Clinic by Cofield and Co, uh, who showed good results, really. Uh, uh, and a later review in 1997 showed an 87% survival of 15 years. And the importance of that means that really anatomic shoulder replacement would come of age. It could match hip and knee replacements. There was an issue with glenoid loosening, and I'll say a little bit more about like that later. At this stage, it's useful, however, to say what is the, um, the history, what, what is the evidence for doing a hemi or a total shoulder replacement? And if you look at literature, we, we have fluctuated between doing hemis, as I said, Nia did a hemi to begin with, and then total shoulder replacement. But I think we now have some good evidence that total shoulder replacement is better. Um, and the first paper really of some Garth et al. in 2000, who did a randomized perspective study, small numbers, only 47 in the series, but compared hemi and total in, in, in a match group. And they found that total shoulder replacements gave better pain relief and slightly better internal rotation. Uh, not much change in any of the other measurements. Pain relief was better. Mm -hmm. Another study again from the United States, Bradley Edwards, a bit lopsided and it was retrospective comparing a large number of totals and a smaller number of heavies, again, showed similar results, that totals were better for pain relief, movement, and function. Uh, a systematic review of meta-analysis in 2005 confirmed this. And the total showed was, again, better for pain relief, better for movement, particularly flexion, and function. From our own work at Wrightington Hospital, which we published in 2007, Again, confirm this, but I'll refer you to the numbers of revisions, which are interesting. If you look at the hemiarthroplasties, uh, whilst the revision rate with total is pretty much the same, the hemiarthroplasties is very early in, in the post-optic period, usually within the first one to two years. And it's usually due to pain and secondary to glenoid erosion. If you look at total shoulder replacement, whilst revisions uh, do occur, obviously, they're often much later. In the, in the process, often due to either instability or glenoid loosening. The next landmark after Nia was 1992, again, two Americans, Matson and, and Charles, Rick Matson and Charles Rockwood, who brought in uh, shoulder anatomic shoulder replacement systems which were modular, in that there were, as you can see from this, a series of different head sizes and depths and a series of different glenoid sizes and depths to match the patient. Uh, with the near prosthesis, basically you had to match the patient to the prosthesis. But in this modular now, we were able to match uh, things a little better. And again, that's my first one in 1994, I think I did that one. And that was the new type of system, quite a long stem humerus, uh, but a modular system that you could match. And these are our results again, showing significant improvement in, in, in functional scores, pain relief, and movement, in all the various diagnoses. And there you can see four or four years, well, actually now published up to 13 years, which showed sustained uh, functional improvement. And, uh, the next step, 2000, was we did offset heads were developed. That is, as you're aware, the humeral head, 
does not sit perfectly on top of the humeral stem. There's often an offset and an inclination. And this, uh, in 2000, these newer offset heads allow you to match for depth and size, but also offset. And we did uh, a study on this showing uh, really a little difference between a non-offset and offset by function and range of motion. But we did, uh, and again, this will probably be a separate talk, but I would introduce you to radiostereographic analysis, which those of you who do hip and knee uh, arthroplasty will be familiar with. Uh, just to say it's a research mod um, uh, capability that allows you to look at problems or identify problems in implants much sooner than if you just follow the natural history. I won't say much more than that. But you can see from this that the blue bar shows that the glenoid components, where there's a non-offset head that's less anatomic, uh, migrated much more than if there was a more perfect match. So the more perfect match you get for the humeral head replacement, it protects the glenoid component. So that's an important factor. And in 2009, the final modification was inclination. So again, you can mirror uh, the humeral head on top of uh, the humeral stem perfectly, although it is a fairly complex articulation. Okay, let's go and now look at the glenoid itself. There have been some changes on the left. You'll see the traditional near or keeled implant, which was cemented into place, and the more recent uh, uh, pegged implant. The difference being that the keeled obviously is in two planes, whereas a pegged implant gives you stability in three planes. Again, this is cemented. The articular surfaces of both components are pretty much identical. In fact, identical across a range of all implants. And, 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 and has been accepted. But the backside, the bit that goes into the glenoid, is been open to two debate. And again, I won't go through it, but complex radiographic analysis has shown that the peg component is much better at fixation and much less early migration compared to the keel component. So the peg components have now pretty much replaced the keel. And there you can see survivorship up to 12 years of pegged implant, again, matching hip and knee surgery. And more recently, and again, uh, an interesting development, whilst we were the view, and I think most people are, that the implant on your left, the peg component, is a cemented peg component, is the state of the art. A new implant was brought in, which was a hybrid really, which was part cemented, the smaller peg, but bone grafted for the central peg. Bone uh, as the anchor peg prosthesis. This was introduced in 2009. Again, using radiostereographic analysis uh, and other techniques, we were able to write it and to show that in fact, this newer type of implant migrated more. So if you like, uh, it was a backward step. And this has recently been confirmed by Ho et al in 2021, when looking at the natural history of this newer type of anchor peg implant, showed a much higher failure rate than the cemented, simple cemented peg component. So you can see that's from their paper showing quite a significant cyst formation around the central pegs. Other uh, developments have been metal backed, and I'll only briefly say this because Steve's going to say a bit more. This got a very bad, re bad rep, really, from Boileau and, and the French group in 2015, showing quite a high failure rate and a high revision rate with their metal back component. I have to say that's not been our experience, and metal back certainly shown good integration into glenoid with little loosening, with opportunities for a correction uh, of uh, deformity of the glenoid, erosion, or in revision cases. And again, Steve will say a bit more about that. Again, uh, as a side, I should mention Steve Copeland, who was from the UK, who in 1976 presented his stemless implant, not stemless, surface replacement, sorry, implant, which is basically a short stem and just replaces the humeral head. It was very, very popular in the UK at one time. One of the problems, as you'd imagine, however, is this type of, and it's very difficult to replace the glenoid because you're not taking the humeral head out, so the access is limited. Uh, and again, results were quite good, but there were problems at going back mm -hmm. to what I said to you initially, that we were not able to replace the glenoid, so this led to uh, problems with... Uh, Glenoid pain. Uh, you can see our study is showing that 
the, the fixation is, is very good for these type of things. But more recently under evaluation, a much shorter stem component, you can see on the left, and in fact stemless, which you can see on the right. And the, the advantage of stemless, as you can see, if you don't have a humeral stem, you should be able to perfectly match the humeral head, in theory anyway. And to finish, uh, these are brand new implants that are coming out now from, and these I've stolen these slides from Lima, showing, as you can see, a very short metal peg. So the benefit of this, of course, is you get good metal integration with trabecular metal, which we've shown to be really excellent and probably will, will solve the problem of glenoid loosening. And a polyethylene peg or component and pegs that fits into the backside of that, hopefully, again, solving the problem of, of, of lean hurdles. So we've come full circle. What are our indications now? Are they still osteoarthritis with an intact functioning cuff and glenoid erosion? Rheumatoid arthritis, well, with mouth worn medication, indications for shoulder orthoplasty there have diminished significantly. But in revisions and fractures, I think they've been replaced now by reverse type components. And the issue is, what happens to the rotator cuff? If it's torn at the time of surgery, do you repair it? Does it heal in the, in the presence of a, a, a shoulder arthroplasty? What is the effect of fatty infiltration? Does the rotator cuff, even though it's intact, does it ever really function again once it's not functioning for a long period of time? And the advent now, and again, this would be a separate talk, is the reverse shoulder replacement has really taken on more shoulder, reverse shoulder replacements are now undertaken than anatomic. Certainly in France, 90% of replacements now are reversed as it was developed there. In the UK, it's now 60 to 70% are reversed uh, and other com countries are following. So indications for reverse, again, osteoarthritis with no cuff, cuff tear arthropathy, trauma, revision, maybe even massive cuff tear, but no arthritis. It's a very reliable solution in the older patient. And I'll leave a question with you. Everybody over the age of 60, even if their cuff is intact, potentially now would have a reverse rather than anatomic replacement. Thank you for your attention. Uh, many thanks, uh, Prof, uh, for such a kind of, you know, extensive overview of uh, what uh, the shoulder arthroplasty was, uh, what it has been, and, and which direction we are going. Now, uh, Prof, uh, you know, if you have to uh, redesign the whole shoulder arthroplasty, what are the things you think uh, you could do differently uh, from what has been done so far with your clinical experience? Yeah, I think if I was setting up a, um, a, a unit from scratch and I was the shoulder surgeon and I had the option of, of deciding which implant, I would predominantly have a reverse implant, probably a short stem reverse implant for, for most patients. Uh, for the younger patient, and maybe 65 or under, I would have an anatomic available. I would have a stemless uh, humeral component and a peg, cemented peg, uh, uh, glenoid component. For trauma, I'd have a long stem reverse uh, implant, which would allow fixation of what is left, or uh, potentially, of the tuberosities. And for revisions, again, predominantly, uh, well, I mean, Steve's going to say more about that, I think, so I'll leave that to him. Sure. Uh, thanks, Prof. Uh and do you think, I think uh, with the, you know, the, the change in the demographics uh, of the patients uh, who are undergoing shoulder arthroplasty, would we uh, have a kind of a different uh, perspective uh, choosing the right implant for them? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the classic change is when the reverse shoulder replacement was introduced from France, the work of grandma uh, became more and more popular. It was decided uh, I think probably wiser, they would be people over 75. But I think as, uh, as we've seen the success and how uh, reproducible I think the results are, uh, I think at one time it was said the complication rate for reverse was higher than anatomic. I don't believe that to be the case anymore now. 
I think reverses the complication rate are the same or even less, and the results are, are more reproducible, particularly with the newer design. And so that age of 75 has come down to 70, 65, and, and, and as you're aware, Ravi, there's now a new study being undertaken in the UK to undertake this in people 60 and above, which is 90, 95% of all shoulder arthroplasties that are done for osteoarthritis. Even if the cuff is intact, you just remove the cuff. So, I mean, things are moving in shoulder arthritis. It's not like hip and knee, that's sort of fairly well established now, I think. Shoulders is still, still moving and moving rapidly. Well, what I say today may well, will, will be out of date in 12 months, two years time, you know? We could be set looking at it quite differently. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, so thank you, Prof, uh, for highlighting these issues. Now, I think uh, once we've decided that patient needs a shoulder arthroplasty, uh, then how do, how do we make sure that we get things right at the first time? And to give us uh, how do we do that, uh, we've got our next speaker, uh, Mr. Monga. Uh, so uh, uh, Puneet is a good friend of mine. I trained with him. Uh, he's an established uh, shoulder surgeon. Uh, at uh, Wrightington Hospital, which we all know as a center of excellence. Uh, and his uh, work is uh, mainly focused on uh, shoulder arthroscopy and arthroplasty. He deals with, uh, you know, kind of weekend warriors to elite athletes. Uh, uh, apart from uh, his uh, extensive clinical experience, he is uh, he's a dedicated uh, uh, you know, trainer. He spends a lot of time in research. And he's been involved with uh, many, uh, you know, publications, uh, national, international presentations. He's been co-authored in many shoulder-related books. Uh, so I think, uh, Puneet, uh, I would not take much of your time and uh, pass it on to you. Uh, Thanks, Ravi. Thank you for uh, asking me to speak on this very important topic. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, so, um, well, it's, a, it's an honor to share this uh, stage with uh, Ian and Steve, both of whom have been my mentors. I've learned so much from them. Um, and like you said, once we've had a decision about going ahead with joint replacement for the shoulder, getting it right first time is so important. It's the attention to detail. So I'll try and cover uh, that aspect and share my experience with you. Um, this is Wrightington Hospital, so those of you who haven't visited, um, please do make plans for visitations once COVID is um, under control. Uh, we have a visitation program and it'll be nice for us to welcome you and let us know via the uh, visitation coordinator. Uh, these are my declarations. I have uh, consultancy agreements for research and teaching with these industrial partners. Um, so purpose of this talk is to get it right first time. Um, essentially, uh, when you're talking about joint replacement, we got a four step plan. First one is to get the clinical assessment that starts when the patient walks into your clinic the second element, which is really important to assess the patient's bone stock. Third, assessing the cuff status, and then finally choosing the correct implant. Now Ian's uh, already described quite well in terms of how to choose the correct implant. So um, I'll go a little bit further into details for perhaps the reverse and the anatomic in this talk. So when a patient walks into clinic and they're expecting a joint replacement, one of the key things we need to do, first of all, is to confirm that the diagnosis is correct. The expectations are appropriate, and we talk them through the risks and benefits of surgery. It is a big operation for most patients, and it is incredibly successful in relieving pain. But there is a small proportion of patients where it doesn't work that well where they might have complications or they, we may not meet their expectations. So having that discussion is so important. Um, at the same time, it's also important to assess their physiological age. I think that goes into the decision 
you know, like Ian said about choosing an anatomical or a reverse joint replacement, the results of a reverse arthroplasty are so reliable now, there is a question of whether we should perform reverses more often. And for that reason, assessing physiological age at an early stage is so important. Once we've done that, the other thing is to assess the bone stock. This is really important. Um, it, you know, we have various modalities available to us to assess bone stock. X-ray is available everywhere. Um, patient walks in, most orthopedic clinics will have ac access to X-rays. That's gold standard. It gives you a diagnosis, it gives you enough room uh, to have a discussion about indication for surgery. So an X-ray performed in clinic will give you an idea whether it's primary, primary glenohumeral osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or post-traumatic arthritis. So that's the start of your conversation with the patient. But what I urge you to do is get a CT scan in almost every patient, well, in every patient who has to have a joint replacement. I would say that's mandatory in today's date. The reason for that is that an X-ray will not give us a good three-dimensional image of the pathology. And you could see an X-ray which looks, okay, it's box standard glenohumeral arthritis. You get a CT scan, it'll show you erosion. And there is no way other than a good CT scan that you can work that out. So in my practice, CT scan is absolutely mandatory before joint replacement. And so it is in, 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 in and across our unit. So uh, CT scans easily accessible in most places and gives you so much more information. So that's your next step in assessing the bone stock. When you look at the CT scan, you'll commonly presented with this image. A radiologist will of course report it as arthritis, but as a surgeon, we need to be able to describe what kind of bone loss that is. And that answer was provided to us quite nicely uh, by um, this research team from France, led by Joe Walsh. This is the most popular classification for glenoid bone loss, um, which is used across the world. Uh, it was modified in 2016. Uh, so A1 is when we have a concentric glenohumeral arthritis with no significant bone loss. A2 is when there is concentric bone loss and the line joining the anterior lip of the glenoid to the posterior lip of the glenoid is transected by the humeral head. So there's deepening of the concavity of the humerus. B1, which is quite rare actually, one starts to see subluxation of the humeral head posteriorly with no erosion. B2, which is quite common and really challenging, especially seen in young patients, is where you get to see posterior erosion of the glenoid. So a biconcave glenoid formation. B3 is when that erosion is significant and that posterior erosion extends into the anterior aspect of the glenoid. Uh, type C is when we see a dysplastic glenoid with or without erosion. And type D, which has again been recently added, is anterior erosion of the glenoid. So identifying these is so important because that's how you then drill into what you do for an individual patient. Uh, the Friedman's method of measuring glenoid version, I would recommend that as a method of version measurement, uh, lines drawn from the base of the scapular body to the middle of the glenoid um, here. So that's, that's the line going across the scapular body. And then a second line is drawn, joining the anterior and posterior lip of the glenoid. And that gives you the glenoid version. So a normal will be plus five to minus 10. We, we've suggested a modification to this Freudman's method. And we, what we suggest, we draw an ellipse onto the parasagittal section of the CT scan, determine the midpoint of that and measure the version over there. That increases the accuracy of measuring such a version. So that's just a modification or fine tuning of the Freudman's method. Um, that's how you measure the version. So that's, that's, that's reliable and uh, we've shown good inter-observer uh, you know, accuracy in that. The next thing is to assess bone loss in the coronal plane. 
Um, and this classification is something which is very simple, easy, and reproducible. Uh, mm -hmm. We measure bone loss um, using E0, 1, 2, and 3. E1 is where you have a concentric bone loss. E2, when you have superior aspect of the glenoid, which is one seen quite often in cuff arthropathy. And E3, when there is erosion extending to inferior glenoid as well. And the, and the things we do for a particular patient will change depending on these erosion patterns in the axial plane and in the coronal plane. Finally, we come to assessing the um, cuff status. Now, the top tip there is to look at the parasagittal sections on the CT scan. And you can look at these uh, sections as you go medially toward the this, this, this scapular body, and you can see the bulk of the rotator cuff surrounding uh, the scapula. It'll give you a very good idea of whether the rotator cuff is intact or not. Actually, it is quite rare to have a concentric glenohumeral arthritis pattern with cuff deficiency. For some reason, that protects cuff from getting torn. So it is quite rare to have a diagnostic dilemma on that. If there is, I think a surgeon perform ultrasound in clinic or an MRI scan is sufficient to give you an answer. Uh, Pre-op investigations, which we use for revision surgery, we tend to use blood tests, CRP, ESR, white cell count, X-ray, CT scans, uh, white cell label scans, extended cultures, and more recently we started using a SPECT CT scan to look at infection and location of such. Uh, if you're getting CT scans, it's nice to request your radiologist to perform CT scans with MAR sequence, that's artifact reduction sequences, and one can again get similar um, sequences with an MR scan. Modern scanners and our clever radiologists, they have all all the tricks in the tool to give us good pictures and assessments with the metal in place. And that's very valuable in our unit where a large proportion of patients are revision cases. Um, more recently, we use a 3D print. Um, we have 3D printer in the unit. We also work with 3D printing partners and uh, getting a 3D print of the glenoid, it gives you a qualitative feel um, of the glenoid deformity. Certainly, when we're operating on complex cases um, where we come to revision or doing custom joint replacement, having a model in theater in hand is very valuable. So moving on from x-rays to CT scan, a 3D print gives you a nice qualitative mm -hmm. definition. Once we got the assessment of the glenoid, the rotator cuff, and the patient's clinical status, then it comes to choosing the right implant. I think that's quite crucial because there's such a wide variety of joint replacements available for a shoulder replacement. There is a reason why there are so many choices available because there's, there isn't the one size which fits all. So it's nice for you to know the options that you have available. Broadly speaking, you know, uh, joint replacements for the shoulder, we can either have an anatomical or reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Anatomical classically is for cuff intact and reverses are classically for cuff deficient shoulder. However, the indication for reverses is expanding rapidly. It's used now for reverses in preference, sorry, in fractures in preference over anatomic. It is used with significant, in, in patients with significant bone loss as a preference. In the older people, perhaps, um, we do not know that answer yet. So, Having those two choices, and again, Ian covered these options. They could have a resurfacing, a head replacement, or a classic stemmed. The stems getting shorter and shorter over a period of time. Um, and again, if you think of the proximal humerus, you can almost think of it as a combination of a cylinder and a hemisphere sitting on top of the cylinder. So there will be variations in the size of the cylinder, so that's the stem diameter. And there'll be a variation in the size of the hemisphere, not only the diameter, but the location of that hemisphere on the cylinder. That's the offset. So you, you, you need to be able to use a system which caters to all these variations in the normal human anatomy. And that's quite crucial when you choose the system. We have a modular system. Almost all modern systems have a 
modularity available now. So that problem is has been sorted in the last 15, 20 years. When it comes to the glenoid, again, Ian covered vast majority of these. Um, there is also an issue about bone preserving when you're doing the surgery. When you look at the backside of a glenoid implant in the anatomical joint replacement, it could either be a convex or a flat back. The advantage of a convex is it's more bone preserving and reduces shear forces. And that's certainly been my uh, go-to implant. And uh, there's a question of keeled versus pegged versus the magic peg or the fluted peg. And that's certainly not been our favorite implant. Um, that's pretty much out of use in the UK. There's also a question of this uh, confirming versus non-confirming design. This is quite fascinating that if we use the same diameter of the humeral head to the diameter of the glenoid, that is, there's no play between them. There is a very high loosening of the glenoid. And that's because the glenohumeral joint not only has a rolling motion, but it also has a physiological sliding motion. So a little play between the diameter of the glenoid, which is, has to be slightly flat compared to the humeral head has been shown to increase survivorship or to reduce the glenoid loosening. And that mismatch should be around six to 10 millimeters. So choosing the right implant, it's important for surgeons to understand the design features as well. Once we got that, the other thing which has changed the game quite a lot for us has been usage of these online planning softwares. This is an example of one of them from um, where you can actually take a patient's CT scan and you can play around, as you can see in this uh, animation, you can play around with the different uh, corrections in 3D planes. You can actually subtract bones, move them around in the 3D plane, and you get a really good idea of what you're dealing with in terms of pathology. I'd certainly recommend that for uh, for surgeons who are starting out with joint replacement to have a have some sort of 3D software available to do that. Once you got that, then you can actually perform virtual surgery. You have a choice of implants on the left-hand column and you can actually place different implants. So in patients with deformity, you can actually place a glenoid component, move it around, uh, change the version, change the rotation. And again, you get a good idea of where your implant might want to sit. Uh, you get some form of report at the end uh, which shows what the correction a particular implant can give you. And again, you know, this is all going back into 3D planning. The more we plan preoperatively, the better chances of us getting a good correction. So I'll run through a few examples of common deformities one what might see in joint replacement. Um, so this is a scan of a patient, uh, for example, with cuff deficiency, at the age of 75. And you can see there's hardly any uh, erosion in the glenoid and there is no significant bone loss on the humerus. The incl inclination doesn't seem to be too bad. And a situation like this, one could consider a standard reverse. Okay, so that'd be your you know, standard day in theater, no significant bone loss. So you, 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 know, you, you, you don't have to worry about building things up. Um, is 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 example of a A2 glenoid where you have a deepening of the glenoid socket, significant osteophyte formation. In this particular patient, the cuff was intact, and the patient uh, patient's age was early 60s. So, uh, in this situation, one could potentially, and this is what I, I did, was use a anatomical joint replacement where you replace the socket with a pegged, uh, cemented glenoid an uncemented short humeral stem. Moving on to a slightly more uh, challenging condition, this patient's a uh, younger patient, and uh, this patient's 45, we can see a B2 glenoid, like we described um, in Walsh's classification. You can see posterior subluxation of the humeral head. And in such a situation, we have different choices. One could either perform a high-sided reaming and make that version flat, one could either perform a reverse or we could use a wedged polyglenoid. So depending on the age, we could, you could choose appropriately. So that's, that's uh, the three options I mentioned. Again, 
we can talk about this particular type of glenar deformity for a complete one hour and we still will have more to say um, but that's the that's one of the most challenging joint replacements one could come across a young patient with a, a progressive bone loss so this is a you can see a 15 degree wedge poly being used here and again we've shown that correction of this type it not only improves the version but it actually corrects the humeral head subluxation as well. Okay, similar problem you can see, we're now going on to a B3 glenoid, uh, the version being around 25 degrees, and such a situation you can use a bigger uh, poly wedge or in an older patient might want to go towards the reverse. Um, in a rheumatoid arthritis with a B3, again, you know, the cuff is deficient, you can see uh, there's proximal migration mm -hmm. of the humeral head and a situation like this, you might want to use a, a, a reverse shoulder arthroplasty with a metallic wedge. Similar situation, you can see, you know, you got a dysplastic glenoid, this is a type C glenoid. And in a situation like this, you could use a, um, either use a bone graft in a younger patient to restore bone stock, or if you have a slightly older patient with higher physiological age, one would end up doing a reverse. And I could go on, here's another example of an anterior deficiency where you use the anterior um, poly wedge in a younger patient to restore bone stock. So I'm just giving you a, a, you know, a brief overview of what type of deformities we might get. Uh, the other thing which I mentioned now, which you're using quite often is customized jigs. Uh, some software solutions allow you to plan jigs at the end of your uh, assessment and you get a jig which allows you to place a wire in the middle of the glenoid. That really is the most important step in a joint replacement, getting the glenoid guide wire right in the middle or right where you want it to be. And these customized jigs have, have been quite useful. This is um, us using it in action. And I'm sure the future is quite exciting in these matters. I think we're gonna see robotic surgery because there is so much to, to base on that central guide wire. One cannot afford to get that wrong. And I can certainly see a role for robotic surgery, robotic reaming uh, to get that precision right along with what we do. Um, we might end up sitting outside the theater. I'm not sure that will happen soon, like prostatectomies um, being done with surgeons sitting outside the operating the theater. I think that, that may not happen soon, but certainly it's a possibility. And I'll, uh, I'll finally come to custom implants. And I've shown you some examples of different implants which you might want to use in different scenarios. But there are certain settings where, where standard joint replacements are just not suitable. And that's an example of one of the very first few cases that we did. A patient who had a reverse, had a breakage of the screws and a dislodgement of the glenosphere. Uh, and we did a two-stage procedure. We removed everything, took some biopsies, and you can see even on the x-rays, there's hardly any glenoid left. And a CT scan, you can see a picture on the bottom left, this massive cavitary defect, um, and picture on the bottom right, you can again see massive defects in the glenoid, and no form of joint replacement would be able to compensate for that. And in such a situation, one would now go to a customized joint replacement and, and Steve's got uh, some amazing experience and fantastic work which he'll share with you after me in the next talk and I'll just show you some of the pictures um, of this particular case to complete just to show how there are certain cases where you just cannot handle with standard implants and that's just how it looks like intraoperatively and postoperatively. This, this patient's now five years out and doing great. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's her picture. And that, that brings me to the end of my talk. And I'd say as a message that we do a huge number of joint replacements in our unit. And the vast majority of patients do so well. But we also see complications from joint replacement. And I think it's important for surgeons to recognize that when it does go bad, it can look really ugly. Uh, and warn patients that complications can happen, uh, even in the most most successful of the operations. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Puneet, uh, for such a, a 
beautiful talk i think you guys make all the patients outcome look beautiful as they make you make uh, uh, look their x rays uh, beautiful as well and i think you've clearly shown that it's a combination of uh, probably human intelligence and the technology which would uh, support us as an orthopedic surgeon isn't it right from uh, selecting right patients uh, selecting right implants uh, having right surgical skills and also technology to support us to get things uh, right uh, at the first go uh, so that you know we can improve the patient mm -hmm. outcome and the longevity now you've clearly said uh, there are various uh, 3d software planning uh, kind of a software available uh, for us as a surgeon to support uh, to choose uh, the implantation is right so i'm just going to run uh, the video uh, before i could take a question from uh, 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 the viewers uh jagan you want to run that video for me please yeah sure jagan sure. yeah i'm yeah. doing it yes please it just shows the how the artificial intelligence is kind of going to take over and uh, you know it just reminds me of uh, stephen hawking's quote you know he said uh, if if the artificial intelligence developing the way it is probably it could spell the end of the human race and it could probably you know uh, it could take off its own and redesign itself isn't it and uh, i think as a human we are so slow in the biological evolution and if we you know we won't, we may not be able to compete with artificial intelligence and soon we will be superseded isn't it uh, jagan you do you want to play that video for us yes i'm doing we look like today thanks to blueprint's auto segmentation technology a surgeon can go from ct scan to 3d plan in seconds Unique to the market, Blueprint puts the surgeon in total control with instant access to essential 3D measurements critical for decision making. Surgeons can design a guide to enable execution of their plan in the OR. This is just the beginning of what to expect from Blueprint, but what's the future look like? Advanced algorithms could make case planning more efficient by leveraging published clinical outcomes to automatically plan each case. Artificial intelligence could learn from the surgeon's planning history and then apply this to each case to enable a more personalized, automated plan. How about tackling a challenging case? Soon, peer-to-peer -peer case sharing in Blueprint could be made possible through a connected network of users enabling a more impactful exchange of thoughts between colleagues. This technology could also transform the way surgeons operate. Today, large amounts of implant inventory is needed in each case to enable sizing of the patient's anatomy during surgery. Tomorrow, Blueprint could predetermine a single implant to fit each individual, generating both inventory and OR efficiencies. Augmented reality surgery could come to life through Blueprint. Imagine surgeons performing virtual planning directly in the OR and then visualizing in real time where to place their instruments and how to prepare the bone. This is the future of surgical guidance. Outside the OR, augmented reality could change the way surgeons learn by applying a virtual plan directly to a surgical model and providing feedback on accuracy. Blueprint's capabilities also extend to patient care. Blueprint could interact daily with the patient to guide them through recovery and rehabilitation. It could notify the surgeon of patient activity and signals the need for surgeon intervention. Blueprint's technology is focused on redefining shoulder arthroplasty and patient care. Right medical, innovation that's driving the future. Thanks, Jagan. Thank you very much. Uh, no problem, sir. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, so clearly, Punita, you've demonstrated the how uh, you know, pre-op planning and the software you guys use have helped uh, to improve the outcome. Now, do you guys uh, do pre-op planning through this software for all the patients undergoing shoulder arthroplasty in the unit? 
so uh, we, I have to say increasingly so. Um, I think there's some cases which um, are beyond the scope of standard implants. And what the software allows you to do is pick that up preoperatively. Uh, and that's really, really powerful. Now, when we take up new technologies, I think they appear quite exciting, but what we have to think of sometimes is the evidence behind the new innovations as well. Um, so as, as, as doctors, as surgeons, we're not only uh, ending up doing things because they feel that they're right, but we also look at the evidence behind it. So our job in the next few years is to generate enough evidence to show that these new technologies are actually better for our patients. So that's the first thing I'd say. Um, so they all have time and resource implications. So we, we, we are using it and I cannot recommend it enough, especially for surgeons who are starting off. If you see a case, um, go ahead, use a 3D planning software you might find that there are certain cases which are beyond the remit of a standard implant, may need bone grafting, may need a custom implant. So those are very, very uh, good reasons to use this software. Um, but yeah, I think we're increasingly using this software for most, for most of our cases, not all yet. I think it's, it's tending towards that. Thanks, Puneet. And do you think uh, there is an additional cost associated with this, or uh, are these becoming uh, are this you know, uh, making more increasingly expensive for patients uh, in terms of using this software? So we we are in a protected bubble in the national health, isn't it? Where the the costs are hidden from us, so we can offer what's what's right for the patient. But I think. Eventually, the costs will be there. Sometimes uh, it's not the cost of the software, maybe the cost of, you know, the time resource that we have to put in um, and costs associated with other things. So, you know, the more software you use, the more uh, jigs you're likely to use, you know, the, you know, the more precise your surgery gets, the more jigs you use. So there will be a cost associated. And this is the, this is the question for the healthcare econo economist whether the costs associated is worth it. Like going back to new innovation, new technology, it may be the right thing to do on the surface, but is there evidence to show that it actually improves the outcomes and the longevity of the implant? That's the question we cannot take our eyes off. So we have to keep eye on that better outcomes in the long term. So uh, even though we talk about all these exciting things, we have to make sure it's actually work. We're, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Like uh, otherwise, otherwise it will not be a sustainable investment, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, we all understood, isn't it? That you, know, you need to have uh, kind of a right selection of the patient and you need to have that clinical uh, assessment to see whether you know, the cost benefit or effective analysis is suitable for just a reserve group of patients uh, with the severe deformity, isn't it? Who would be benefited with this additional cost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how much of, uh, do you think the base place contact area in your practice you consider as a cutoff to choose uh, either augment or a bone graft or use the software planning? Uh, so again, it's not a, uh, a specific number, uh, it depends on what case we're dealing with, the age and uh, the setting overall. But the least you ever need is 75%. I think if you're using an uncemented implant, 75% uh, of contact is reasonable. Like I said, it depends on the setting. If you have a high-performing patient who's going to um, uh, put a lot of stresses through that implant bone interface, you want a lot higher contact surface. Um, if the bone quality is poor, then 75% may not be enough. Uh, but that's the bare minimum, I would say, that you cannot have anything less than that. Uh, you should definitely aim for 90% to 95% in almost all cases, uh, preferably 100%. So there's a, like I said, there's a compromise to be made between the patient's age, amount of bone loss, quality of bone, um, and that cannot 
yet be defined in numbers. So from the hip surgery circuit, that number comes for at 75. Uh, but in the shoulder surgery circuit, I do not think that number exists yet, as far as I'm aware. So that, that's work which needs to be done. So that currently remains an opinion. Thanks, thanks, Puneet. Thanks for such a, a good explanation. And I think uh, we've, we've kind of understood that, uh, you know, we've tried to uh, solve the problem from the humeral side, but glenoid seems to be problem like uh, it is in the hip where acetabulum is a problem. Uh, I think uh, to give us an idea how you deal with this uh, glenoid, I'm going to have uh, Steve Bale uh, giving us a uh, talk on how he manages glenoid bone loss and is in a role of uh, custom-made implant. So let me introduce Steve. Uh, Steve is a, a senior uh, orthopedic surgeon at uh, Wrightington Hospital. Uh, he specializes in shoulder surgery. Uh, with his uh, mixed practice of arthroscopy work for, uh, you know, uh, instability, cuff problems, uh, sports injuries, along with the arthroplasty practice for his uh, arthritis in the shoulder. Uh, he, he is over the last, I think, a decade or so, Steve has done extensive research on shoulder arthroplasty, uh, you know, managing the, the glenoid deficiencies and coming up with uh, some sort of solution to aid uh, you know, wide uh, orthopedic group to see how they can deal with this problem. Uh, Steve has finished his uh, you know, training in orthopedics from Northwest, uh, and uh, he has been uh, extensively trained during his uh, fellowship and uh, has been practicing as a, uh, you know, a consultant for more than 25 years now. Uh, he does uh, travel uh, a lot across different continents to share his experience and knowledge on shoulder arthroplasty and arthroscopic work and given numerous lectures across different platforms. Uh, uh, he is uh, kind of, uh, he's got, a, he's passionate about, I think, research training and he's trained many, uh, you know, next generation shoulder surgeon. He has been a former training program director in the Northwest and for his uh, dedication towards training, he was also awarded uh, uh, the Bota National Trainer. He does uh, contribute uh, to the teaching and uh, is in a kind of an examiner for FRCS or the exam. Uh, so over to you, uh, Steve. Uh, Thanks very much, Ravi, for the introduction. I'll just share my, um, my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so thanks for um, joining the meeting and wherever you are today, hope you're having a good time. Um, I'm going to try and go through the decision-making process which we developed um, around around glenoid bone loss, and it will interplay with with um, aspects of my colleagues' talks as well. This is where we're um, this is where we're from. We always have to put a slide up of where we are because um, most people don't know uh, where Wrightington is in the world. If you ask people, they think it's in London mostly. Um, how come? How can we tell? How can we say we're experts? Well, my colleagues and I have extensive experience with bone grafting. Um, we've started doing this in 2013, and we've done over 350 uh, bone grafts. And we have um, extensive um, experience now with with um, custom implants. There are lots of ways of dealing with um, with glenoid bone loss. And the way you deal with it depends on the extent of the loss. Is it just a small amount of posterior wear? Is it a big central defect associated with um, a previous implant? Is it a huge defect associated with polyethylene wear debris? Um, or is it um, um, due, to, due to infection? We used to do hemiarthroplasties for patients with, with glenoid bone loss because we had no way of dealing with it. And that was really a salvage procedure as a way of relieve it, relieving pain. But now we have a lot of ways of dealing with bone loss and, and Panit's touched on that already. We don't tend to do just a little bit of reaming these days uh, because that reduces uh, glenoid volume and glenoid strength. But we have the ability to use wedges and the wedges can be made of bone, they can be made of polyethylene as part of the implant. And we can use bone graft, and that can be impaction bone grafting, 
and my colleague Ian Trail uh, wrote papers about impaction bone gra grafting for for shoulder revision um, a long time ago, and got the got the inspiration really from from taking the technique from the hip surgeons, uh, and it, it is still possible and still useful to impact bone graft uh, defects which are contained or they're easily containable. And where do we get our bone from? Well, if it's a primary case, then the humeral head is the obvious source of bone grafting. Uh, but we have experience of taking um, bone from the pelvis in a, in a, in a careful way. Um, and we take it ourselves. And the Americans are sometimes um, surprised that we don't have pelvic surgeons to do that for us. But it's it, it done carefully, it can, it can produce as you can see here, large amounts of good quality bone. We can use allograft, although our experience of allograft is not uh, as extensive, extensive as autograft. Uh, there are reports of um, bone being taken from the distal clavicle. And uh, we've also used some dual biology techniques where we've taken bone harvested from the, uh, the, the femoral canal. Um, and those techniques are, are described in the literature. And we've shown this slide already, and this was our first, our first real presentation, uh, looking at looking at our experience where uh, metal backs um, and bone graft were used. And we started, as I say, in 2013, and we were able to publish um, our early results at the best meeting in Sheffield in 2015. Subsequently, we've been able to uh, look at our two-year results of our first 50 patients. And you can see that there's the, uh, quite a natural age range of patients. And a lot of those patients required um, structural bone graft. And you can see that we did anatomic replacements with bone graft, and we did a lot of reverse replacements in bone graft. And that is a real reflection of the trend. And that, that trend has continued. And the proportion of reverse replacements has uh, significantly outweighed the proportion of anatomics. You can see the, um, the indications for those, um, for those uh, operations. It's complicated surgery, revision surgery, and these are difficult operations and therefore complications uh, do occur. Um, some of those complications uh, relate to uh, immediate post-operative problems. Uh, we had a hematoma and we've had some problems with the iliac crest. And as you get in other, in other shoulder surgeries, we had some instability, we've had some deep infections, and we've had um, some loosening. But the really, impressive, the really impressive outcome for this is to show that bone grafts and metal backs lead to a very good survivorship of the base plate. And if the cuff fails, you can, in an anatomic, you can then, re, you can then revise that because you can be pretty sure that your base plate is going to be stable. And the uh, results for this difficult surgery are show favorable improvements in the clinical scores across, across the various types of, um, of, of operations. So we know, we know that bone grafts um, are useful. What we didn't understand necessarily was how the fixation has to be achieved in order for that bone graft and base plate to survive. And we have different experts saying different things about how much of your metal work needs to be in the native bone. And Anders Eklund said he wanted 10, 10 millimeters of, um, of base plate uh, in the native bone. And Ludwig Siebauer says, well, I want 50% of all my metal work in native bone. So we thought we would look at how much metal work we needed in our series to get good results. So we looked at a series uh, of 65 patients with um, uh, metal back TT, and we looked at their CT scans, and we worked out uh, how much of the um, metal work was in native bone. And we did this by measuring the trabecular um, the trabecular metal you can see here uh, in in native bone. We're not worried about this. This is this is the this is the bullet nose. This is not trabecular titanium. That is trabecular titanium. That's in bone graft, and that's in native bone. And it's that we were we were, were interested in. 
Um, independent ex independent uh, examiners uh, examined the the CT scans on different occasions to in in include that we were getting uh, proper proper results. And you can see here that is an implant where there's nine nine and a half millimeters of um, trabecular titanium uh, in the native bone, and there's seven in in that. And remember, we're developing the use of bone grafts to fill defects. So we were trying to push new boundaries. And here's a case where we were trying to push things too far. So there's a huge bone graft there, but there's only a small amount of trabecular metal in the native bone. And in that case, there was failure of, of that base plate. And what we found was that if we have more than six and a half millimeters of, of metal in native bone, then we would get a stable implant. So we go for at least at least nine to 10 millimeters now, uh, certainly in my practice, that's what I um, measure up on the CT scan to make sure that I've got um, that level of implant in. And it often means using the longest pegs available. So you've got bullet nose that, that may actually penetrate the glenoid vault, as much trabecular titanium in native glenoid, and then the trabecular titanium that is in the, in the bone graft as well. So what happens to the bone graft over time? We knew from studies that integration after the, after the surgery is good. So our practice is that we take um, CT scans at between three and four months and look at integration. And we, we know that that integration at that stage is good. Well, what happens in the longer term to our bone grafts? And this has been, um, this has been recently published. Uh, we looked at uh, CT scans in patients uh, two years down the line from uh, their arthroplasty uh, and considered their um, clinical and their radiological follow-up. And the important take-home message from this is that the integrated bone grafts stay integrated and the volume of the bone graft stays largely unchanged over time. So we can, we can, we can propose that those bone grafts do become an integral part of the, of the construct and are not going to uh, dissolve away. What's been our experience with, with allograft? Um, well, we, we've looked at this and I continue to look at this um, and we don't think it's quite as good as, as autograft. If you look at autograft, we get full integration in over 90% of cases. And in our first review of allograft, the full integration was nowhere near that. Although in a more, in a, in a, in a more, um, in a more detailed study, um, the allograft is not too bad, but it's not as good as autograft. And Certainly from my perspective, I would find it very difficult um, to use allograft where there's been previous sepsis because of problems of recurrent sepsis in, 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 in our group. And because we don't know yet what happens to the allograft in the long term, I'd be worried about using allograft in young patients where over time the, the allograft could, uh, could resorb. Um, so in these cases, you have to, you don't have to, you can't assume that, that integration has taken place. Um, there is a place for allograft, uh, but avoid in, in previous sepsis. So, so where are we now? We've now done over 350 um, bone grafted cases, and we have become able, as Panit says, to try and understand the way the patient will follow which, which pathway when they present with a particular deformity. Now we concentrated on, on bone grafts, but even in the time that, this, that these, this, this work has been taking place in the last seven, seven years or so, there have been so many changes in shoulder replacement. Um, and Ian, Ian has highlighted this, that shoulder replacement has developed rapidly over that time. And there will be limits to bone graft and the bone grafting um, limits will, 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 or the bone graft indications will change because of new innovation. There has to be enough bone 
there to take the peg for the bone graft uh, the implants. And there's now a possibility to do custom implants and we use uh, the ProMade system. So we've developed algorithms now um, to determine the, the way the patient will be managed as they, as, the, as they present, much in the same way that Puneet um, discussed. Now, if we look at the totality of our bone grafts, you can see that it's, it's a widespread experience, but it's going to change. And what I mean by that is that at this end of the bone grafting spectrum, where small bone grafts are being used, it's likely that the wedges, be they polyethylene or be they metal, will take over that portion of our bone grafting experience. It's also likely in our experience where we've pushed, where we've pushed things too hard or too far and that bone graft with a, with a central peg just isn't enough, that part of our experience here will become more of the um, custom implant. But we'll still be left with an area in the middle where bone graft is, uh, is an indication. This is one of my favorite quotes from a friend of mine in Australia. And it really is a very important concept is that the whole, the whole future of your shoulder implant depends on the stability of your glenoid fixation. And if you can get good quality, long-term glenoid fixation, then you have a chance of getting a functional um, shoulder replacement in both the revision and in the, and in the, um, and in the complex primary cases. We have to remember that we're starting off from a pretty small starting point. There's not much bone there to start. And that bone is often reduced by the wear, which Panit's shown occurs in osteoarthritis and rheumatoid and cuff arthropathy. And the wear that's associated with glenoid failure and infection and the wear that can be associated with chronic dislocation. And in order to achieve a stable implant, intonative bone, um, we have to work um, usually um, on a um, central peg and, and um, central peg area, we need bone there. We tend to need bone there into the base of the coracoid. And we like to have bone down into the, um, into the scapula. To get, a, to get a screw into that area. And if you haven't got that um, bone available, then you have to start thinking about novel ways of getting your fixation um, when that bone is not present. And as, as with every uh, new uh, implant or implant type, very close, very close uh, observation of your cases has to be undertaken to ensure that uh, you're not causing any harm to the patient and that your, your implant is having a useful, uh, a useful function. And we started by looking at our first few um, ProMade cases. Panit, Panit presented a nice one from uh, 2015. And these are going back now until 2015. So the TT metal back bone grafting stuff only came, in, only came out in 2013. And within two years, we now have a whole new possibility with, 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 with custom implants. And that's how rapidly the, um, the, the situation is changing. So the first group, we had um, uh, 19 patients and 17 of those had implants, uh, two didn't for, for a number of reasons. And um, one of the reasons is that these patients are often elderly, often, um, quite un, un, infirm medically, and it's very important. If you're going to the, go to the expense and, and, the, um, and the extent of it doing uh, custom implants, they need to be fit for that surgery. And you don't need to be um, doing, the, doing the planning, uh, having a, a very expensive prosthesis made, and then finding out that they're not fit for an operation. And we looked at 
the initial the initial series where they had a, a minimum of one year follow up, the indications for surgery um, are probably what you'd expect um, for that that kind of thing: bone loss due to infection, bone loss due to aseptic loosening. It's interesting that failed hemiarthroplasty at the end, and particularly failed surface replacement arthroplasty, is now becoming an increasing indication um, because when they start to erode they can produce very considerable bone loss in a fairly short length of time if they were done where, where, there, were, where there was bone loss uh, to start with. We looked at the radiological outcomes in our patients uh, and C CT scans were done in 14 of those patients. And in all of those patients, there was very good integration between the back of the prosthesis and the native, and the native glenoid bone. Now, clearly, we were going to have some problems. And in that first series, we had one um, uh, patient with instability of the implant. And we, this lady on the left here, who originally had pus pouring out of, out of two holes in her, in her, in her arm, um, has, a very st has a stable implant now with, with, with good function to a slightly above 90 degrees, but probably has a very, very low grade infection um, she has a lay, uh, slightly labile CRP and sometimes the skin on her, on her shoulder gets um, discolored, um, but there's been no further frank infection and she remains on antibiotics. So where we are, where are we now? We're now in a situation where we've done, um, this is probably slightly old this slide, but um, over 80, I would say now, custom implants. Um, and you can see that there's a range of there's a range of types of procedure. Um, there are operations where we take the original metal work out and treat them with a spacer and then do the planning and then they do the custom implant. And there are there are operations where we take the metal work out and we do the planning and we insert the glenoid. And because we're not quite sure or convinced of the of, of the fixation, we let that glenoid integrate and then go back and do the second part of the second stage as it were and in some complex primary cases where there's been no previous surgery you can do the whole surgery uh, at the first at the first setting but the, the results even in this difficult in this, in this difficult surgery are good with excellent um, pain relief and um, good improvements in patient reported outcomes uh, in this difficult group. So they're never going to be sparkling, but they're happy that they've got a functioning shoulder with little pain, as opposed to what they would have got, what they would have got with a, an excision arthroplasty or a large head hemi uh, just, just for pain relief. And the integration of the glenoid in achieving that stable glenoid, which we said was the most important thing, is over 90 percent. So Panit showed some um, pictures and I'll show you some some um, some details as well. You can see here this is a surface replacement arthroplasty which has significantly worn, worn away the glenoid uh, posteriorly. You can see that the, 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 the humeral head is inside the acromial line. It's right down to the base of the coracoid um, and there's considerable bone loss which you can't you can't do um, easily with um, a bone graft. You could take bone graft from the pelvis, but there's no there's no humeral head bone to use. So your 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 choices would be pelvic bone graft, and the patients aren't really great with that. They it means an extra day or two in hospital. It's very very painful, uh, and there are there are risks. And if the patients had hip replacements, as many of our patients had. Our hip colleagues are not particularly keen uh, on us digging around in the pelvis just above their acetabulum. So the CT scans are then sent for uh, analysis by our engineers, and they will uh, give us a 3D representation of, of, the glenoid, of the glenoid deformity. Now, this one is covered in blue stuff, and that's because the first CT scan was done, and for some reason or another, the patient was delayed. Now, we have to be very careful that the glenoid deficiency doesn't change because if it changed before the operation was done, 
then we then the, the implant would no longer fit. So it's very important that the time limit on the implants is six months. Now it may be that the, these, these don't change and that's something we're looking at as well is how much things change over time. But the blue and the white CT representations are basically on lay studies that show very little uh, real change in, in the glenoid deformity over that time. The um, proposals then come uh, to us from the engineers and they fit um, the implant uh, to the patient as opposed to the other way around. And you can see it looks a little bit like a normal base plate, but it has a large amount of augmentation in this case posteriorly and additional bone uh, in the base of the coracoid uh, is being utilized for the fixation. Now, it doesn't need to have a, a massive central peg um, uh, like we use in the normal bone grafted ones because the central peg is not the source of the, of, of the um, integration. It's the backside of the implant, which has the trabecular coating. And we're looking for backside contact between the implant and the native bone to get our, um, to get our fix. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't propose that we get 100% contact. Uh, that would be unreasonable. That's what we're aiming for. But what we are getting probably is multiple, multiple um, little spot wells between trabecular titanium and the, and, and the native bone, which give the implant its, um, its stability. Um, the planning, as Pliny said, is extremely important. And um, over time, the, the engineer and the, and, the, and the surgeon get um, to know each other and they can almost predict the kind of implant that you might want. And I want to recreate um, the lateralization. And I want to achieve a humerus, which is uh, where the tuberosity is outside the line of the acromion. And all, and all these things are considered um, by the engineer uh, to produce the implant uh, that you require. And as Panit says, the, um, it's very useful to have representations of your glenoid in theatre, and you can do this in the operating room, on the back on the back table, and you can look at your um, implant. You can expose your glenoid. You can then compare your glenoid exposure with the um, with the backside table, uh, just to make sure that you've got the same. It all looks the same, and then you can compare your ultimate drilling site with your uh, implant, you can compare, uh, you can look at backside contact of your uh, in project, project, projected implant. And there, there, are, there are a number of, there are a number of, of, um, of models that you can have, um, which will allow you to do that with, with holes in and slats to see the backside contact. And really it's, it's up to you to discuss with the engineer, the kind of, the kind of, um, the kind of, um, jigs that you want or the models that you want. Um, I don't think I need to show you the whole thing, but um, this is, this is, this is, this is this in, in action. Um, Panit's already shown you, um, that's taking the old one out. You can see exposing the glenoid. Glenoid exposure has to be perfect. There's no, there is no, um, there is no substitute for perfect glenoid, um, perfect glenoid exposure. And you have to work hard to get the soft tissues out of the way because you've got to remember the engineers are producing this implant for you in the absence in the absence of, um, of soft tissues. They don't they don't um, you know they don't they don't they don't appreciate that. And if you don't get if you don't get that right, the the, the um, there's the guide wire going in. I'm going to drill over the guide wire. But if you don't get the um, the glenoid the glenoid um, exposure right then you're not going to get your, your jig to fit properly. Um, and therefore you're not going to get your um, implant to sit in. And you can see they're just, just tapping in the implant. This implant's got a, um, uh, a coracoid outrigger. And you can then, you can see, you can, you can actually see that your, 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 your implant is going to be, go directly onto the coracoid. And this is, 
and this is the, the, the patient um, post-operatively uh, in, in that case. And you can see you've got good backside contact between your implant uh, and your glenoid bone. Here's a case where we've just done the, uh, the glenoid implant and there were maybe mild concerns about fixation. Um, and then we've gone back in later on to do the definitive procedure. I have to say that I'm more and more trusting now of, of the fixation I'm getting. Um, before I was always a bit concerned, but I, now I know that these things do fit and they're accurately fitting. I'm much happier now to go straight to um, the full construct rather than, um, rather, rather than waiting. And it really just takes out another step in that patient's process. Another, another operation, another, another insult to the anterior glenoid, which you, you really want to maintain to gain function. As, as Puneet says, bone loss can be very, very substantial. And there are, there will still be limits to custom implantation. There's no doubt about that, but we're yet to define those limits. I'm sure we will, we will over time. But the more, the more bone loss there is, the different strategies then come into play. And Puneet's shown nicely um, the, the addition of not just the, the coracoid outrigger, but an acromial outrigger as well. Now that can be an acromial outrigger as a foot to press as a buttress or an acromial outrigger with a screw hole. I'm not keen on a screw going into that, into that hole as I, as I, as I think it could create a, a stress riser and you don't want to get an acromial fracture in that position um, as it will um, potentially to a fracture and that would be disastrous for the, for the function. But you can see as bone loss progresses, here we've lost the coracoid, and um, the first the first plan was to put flanges on. You can see there's a there's a there's a, there's a male post here because there wasn't enough room for a for a, for a peg at all. But in actual fact, we um, we came around to using an acromial um, buttress in this case, and that buttress has trabecular titanium on it, and that um, that fuses or integrates to the, the acromial bone. But clearly, you've got to be very careful in dissection to get that foot in the right place. We've done cadaveric studies, and we've looked at um, implanting um, the implants, uh, and then sending them to CT. And we can we can look with overlay studies at the difference between what we were told we could achieve and what we actually did achieve. And these are, these are useful in, in our understanding of, of how we perform with these implants. And because they're still surgeon dependent um, uh, insertion error, potentially, this has led us to come uh, to further uh, refinements of the jigging process, which allow us to accurately um, make sure that as we're inserting the implant, the rotational um, positioning is, is right. If we're inserting an implant and the screws are longer or shorter than we um, anticipate, it usually means we've rotated in the wrong position. Um, but small amounts, small amounts of, um, uh, small amounts of, um, of insertion um, issues are probably uh, tolerable. Because remember, we're looking for spot wells behind the implant as opposed to complete integration. And remember, we're putting a hemisphere on the end of this implant and therefore minor rotational issues at the base of the glenoid level may not be important by the time we're looking at the implant um, glenosphere humeral inter interface. But uh, I'm obviously gonna show you a good result but you can achieve uh, good, good results. And this is a man who had a custom implant for erosion associated with a Copeland prosthesis at six weeks. Forwards for me now. Right away at the top. And it was that left shoulder. Down again. <laughs> now go up the side for me. 
and down again. Okay. Can you put your hand to your chin? Top of your head? Back of your head. Perfect. Forwards for me now. Not a bad result. Clearly, that's, a, that's one of the better results. But generally speaking, without major, major complications, uh, the patients are very happy with their pain relief and they're happy that they've got more function than they had before uh, and they're not in a, in a totally sal sal a total salvage situation. But we're yet to define the, end, the, um, the total uh, potential for this kind of um, intervention. And it's not for people who've done no shoulder surgery before. You need to have a very extensive um, uh, past history of doing shoulder replacements, of adequate glenoid reconstruction, and dealing with all the techniques associated with revision before you start doing this. And uh, I have to say, I've had, patient, I've had people come to visit me who have ordered ProMades straight away, and they've only been consultants for a very short time. And one has to worry uh, about decision making uh, in that um, in that area, uh, particularly when we're trying to get these things right first time. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks for such a kind of a succinct uh, presentation on uh, how to deal with uh, a complex problem like you've shown. Uh, since it's clearly not a kind of you know easy procedure, there is a uh, lots. Uh, uh, happening on background with the decision making, counseling with the patient, and pre op planning and execution, isn't it? So, uh, Steve, what would be your advice for a surgeon worldwide who are probably encountering problem like this in their practice? How would you, you know, kind of uh, uh, allow them to get on with the procedures like this? And what would be your suggestion with your experience you had over so many years? I think. I think. The way we de develop things at Wrightington is that um, we're very much a group. It's very much a group process. I think the MDT approach to this kind of problem is paramount. Um, we we meet. We have MDT twice a week. Uh, one is pretend. One one is mainly shoulder. One is 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 um, an elbow. One is on his hand and wrist. And in the shoulder meetings, we discuss um, all these complex uh, problems. Um, we have consultants there, um, we have radiologists and microbiologists there, and we discuss the various issues. And we come to a consensus um, of approach, whether that's one stage or two stage, um, spaces, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, we look at the, the kind of implants we've got. Um, I'll discuss with Puneet, say, there's a B2 glenoid. Does he think this is appropriate for an augmented poly? Uh, people will say, no, we don't think it is. Um, it's going to be a bone graft or, or there might well be um, you know, a custom implant in, in severe cases. And those, that's particularly in the, in, the, in the cases of the very severely uh, worn out glenoid. But it's very much a team approach. And I think that should be um, everyone's approach if they can do. I know it's difficult when you're an independent practitioner, but I do think that having some form of, uh, of reference network is really important um, even if it's with other other colleagues in other hospitals, um, because you know the, the patient is the centre of, of that of that of that work, and and our patients are told about the MDT uh, results immediately after this, with our, in in a, in a letter or in a in a face to face uh, consultation when we can do, and it's very important that decision making process is transferred to the patient, and it's very it's powerful information for the patient. If you've got a patient. With a, with a shoulder problem, with a glenoid problem or a humeral problem. And you can say to that patient, I've discussed this MDT and my six colleagues all agree that this is the right, this is the right way forward. That's very strong evidence for the patient to make their mind up about, about, their, about their surgery. Yeah, I mean, uh, clearly you've shown that there is a shared decision-making process you guys follow and it clearly works for you. And I don't think uh, any reason it wouldn't work for other centers or the people across uh, different countries, isn't it? Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, you rightly said uh, that there is a, a significant learning curve in this. There is, uh, especially with the technical difficulties, there is increased operating time, you know, uh, and there is increased cost. So I think you got to select those patients in a correct process, isn't it? Uh, 
you do you do and and because it's a rapidly changing area of, of endeavor the interaction not just with your colleagues but with with the engineers is also important you've got to spend time with the engineers um, getting to grips with the case and understanding what can be offered to you as a surgeon and then you've got you've got to choose the different things that you like about about what they're offering you and about about developing the jigs i mean we we've come we've come we've come a long way with 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 jig development because what we originally were getting at the start was too big and too bulky and didn't fit properly and by by feedback to the engineers those those issues are now much much better but you're right there's there, there are cost implications the, this is not this is not cheap surgery um and i think that's another reason why the mdt is important uh, that you know you can justify doing it because your colleagues and you have come to that conclusion that that is the right thing to do and i know there are people around around our region who whose hospitals have said look we're not doing that it should be done in a specialized center and that's a difficult argument because um, you know, getting it right first time is really important. Um, the surgeon might think he's able to do that and, and you know, have the technical ability to do it, but there are hoops to go through. And I think um, having the MDT uh, activity up and running is important. Going to visit people to see what they do is important. Going to visit, uh, going, going on courses where this is discussed and um, custom implants are, are, are implanted in cadaveric workshops is also is all part of the development process which the, which the surgeon should go through before he starts sending for uh, custom implants uh, to be ordered. Because they're, you know, these are £10,000 and above. They're not, they're not cheap implants. And what, what you don't want to happen is for that surgeon to have a go at doing custom implants and it not work because he's not exposed the glenoid properly or he's not applied the jig properly and therefore he poo-poos the problem. But, you know, we don't, want, we don't want the patient to go through that and then have to come maybe to us to, to have that thing sorted out. So it has to be done in a very planned and controlled way. Thanks, thanks, Steve. And I think uh, we've probably, I think, are lucky in NHS that we've got, you uh, know, kind of an NJR to support what's happening all across the country and we can, you know, assess our own results and then kind of have some sort of uh, framework developed for ourselves, isn't it? Uh, and I think many countries have taken this on the board. I'm sure, you know, a lot of countries are going in that direction, developing their joint registry uh, to understand uh, what they were doing 10 years ago and what's an outcome of that. Uh, so, uh, just question to Prof. Prof, do you think, uh, you know, the, the looking mm -hmm. at the NJR, uh, how do you think uh, our practice is going? We've clearly seen uh, increasing number of uh, reverses uh, compared to what we were doing uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, no, no. The NJR is showing that the number of reverses, as I said, I alluded to you earlier, the, 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 if you like, the surgical community has already made the decision, really, that people over 65, 70, the number of reverse shoulders is growing significantly, the expense of anatomics. And hence now research is being undertaken to see whether the outcome is better, even in younger age groups. So yeah, I think NGRs are almost uh, a leading uh, research now. Things are happening, surgeons are changing because instinctively they know it's better. And uh, as I say, research will follow that now, and probably to prove it even drive it further. As I say, maybe one time at some stage we don't do anatomic shoulder replacements again. Certainly, the numbers will be significantly diminished. It may be known in the very young age group that they've done. Who knows? I mean, the pendulum could swing back again, but it certainly seems to be that the surgical community in the UK and in other countries. Uh, the move towards reverse now is, is unstoppable, it seems to me. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, any thoughts uh, from your side, Puneet? Uh... Um, I, I, I'll just say I've quite enjoyed the talks and um, quite a nice session. I'll just reiterate 
what uh, Ian and Steve said, you know, when, when you're talking about uh, cases, there's such a fast changing field. Uh, the evolution is rapid. Working in teams is, is definitely the way forwards for this. I've had the uh, benefit of mentorship, as I said before, from Ian and Steve over the last 10 years is the MDT approach, the fact that you have, you have cases which we can do jointly together. And, you know, we monitor our outcomes, look at our results. I think any new technology exciting as it may be, um, I think unless it's, unless it's backed with science and evidence of better outcomes, we have to be careful as, as doctors before we, before we, you know, give it a final seal of approval. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just my, thoughts really at this stage so thanks uh, thanks uh, prof i think uh, before we could uh, conclude i just want to thank uh, our speakers here prof trail uh, uh, steve and puneet thanks for sharing your valuable experience across the uh, you know audiences from all across the countries uh, and i'm sure they would be benefited and we would be hampered with uh, many questions uh, over next few weeks so I want to thank Auto TV UK for uh, you know sharing the platform and the Striker uh, you know Right Medical which has been taken over by Striker last month for uh, the the educational support uh, and uh, you know uh, again uh, so uh, so I just want to announce our next webinar on 18th of July uh, it's going to be on the elbow trauma uh, and we've, you know kind of how do young consultants elbowing the elbow trauma. So, uh, you know, I look forward to see all the viewers again. And I just want to reiterate what we're doing as a Northwest Education Academy since last uh, eight, nine months that, you know, we're providing this evidence-based webinars uh, to uh, viewers all across uh, you know, different countries and, you know, seeing whether they, uh, this knowledge which is shared can be adopted or you know embraced in their practice as well. So please do you know get in touch with us on the email address uh, which is nweducationacademy at gmail.com. And again, I think I would like to thank uh, all the speakers. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>